Yeah. Let's go to Trey Yings. Guys, uh, we're just, we can hear a direct impact. A rocket just slammed into the building right next to where we're at. Uh, you can see soldiers just arrived on the scene. Just, uh, so guys, I just want to give you a little bit of uh, what the situation was here. Walk with me, you need you off. Okay, so just a, a moment to go. Sirens were sounding. We followed our plan. Uh, we got straight to cover. Um, and then we heard a loud explosion rocking the ground right next to us. It, it appears there has been a direct impact. Uh, this was not intercepted. It was a, a massive explosion. And you can see the car right there has some damage. Uh, it appears there are no casualties, but this is very close to where reporters have been, have been covering the situation along the border. Um, and there is some sort of siren from inside the building going off. Um, and just uh, pan here, excuse me, sir. And you can see this car here has some damage to it. Uh, this is all very fresh, uh, just a, a moment ago. So let me take you through what happened here, guys. We're uh, right along the Israel-Gaza border. Uh, this area has not been taking much fire recently, but uh, um, just to, we, we saw something coming off the Gaza Strip. Sirens sounded. You have about 10 seconds to get to cover here. I'm a little out of breath because we, we ran straight to cover. Something slipped past Israel's missile defense system, and it slammed into the ground. We're not sure what sort of damage was done to the building. Uh, and, and, uh, and this building right here, it's the same building we've been next to. It's a kindergarten, actually, that was hit. There were no students inside. It's, it's nighttime, and it's also Shabbat. Um, but a lot of journalists around here. Uh, again, no casualties, but quite a, a lot of shrapnel in this area. Trey, Guys, how many yards from you did that rocket land? I mean, that was pretty close. Yeah, this this landed um, just just maybe a hundred feet from where we were standing. Um, but again, we uh, we have safety protocols in place, and so when something like this happens, we've already discussed what to do. So you'll notice we were about to come on air, and. We couldn't actually see that round come off the Gaza Strip. It, it may have been mortar fire. We're, we're still not able to establish if it was a small rocket or if it was a mortar. Um, but immediately the siren sounded here. You have just a few seconds to get to cover, so we didn't even pick the camera off. We got immediately to cover. Our entire crew was in cover, but our, our colleagues that we are, are close with were next to us. They were not in cover. Again, no one was hurt here. There are no casualties from what we can see. Uh, but all of the journalists that you see around, this is an area where journalists have been reporting. And if you just look at the ground here, uh, some, some of the glass uh, from these cars. And if I could just step in front of you here, Yaniv, uh, you can see some of the shrapnel marks in, in the side of this car here. Let these reporters get out of the way. Uh, that's shrapnel, and, and you can see that cut right through a car. And so if it can cut through a car, uh, it can certainly injure and kill people. Um, I, I also want to have Yaniv, my cameraman, pan in here. If you look at the side of this building here, there's a, a green wall. And on that wall, there are huge uh, shrapnel marks all, all up and down the wall. Uh, just an indication that the shrapnel hit this area and was spread out. And uh, we're just going to shine the light in there so you can see it. Trey, but, is that, is that uh, green yeah, this wall? Is just, this gives you a sense of what the aftermath is like. Yeah, yeah is, is that green wall the wall of the kindergarten? I ask that because, you know, Israel goes to great pains to not hit hospitals, not hit civilian targets. Would this have been targeted? How do you hit a kindergarten in Israel? Yeah, it, it likely was not targeted, uh, the fire that's been been taking place. And I mean, look, this is this shows you right here. This shrapnel just tore right through. It, it's all over the side of this kindergarten. I mean, we're, again, we are just coming to this scene minutes. We were here about to go up on air to speak with you when this was taking place. And uh, you can you can see just how large the blast was. I mean, we've walked down here. Um, but again, let me show you this car. And just by sheer chance, we were parked on the other side today, uh, we normally park here. Uh, so our team, our, our equipment, our crew, everyone is safe. Um, but you can see the windows blown out on this crew car for someone um, and, and quite a bit of, of journalists around here. But uh, in terms of whether or not this building was targeted, 
Hamas has been uh, using mortars to hit this area and also small rockets. They don't have the precision that uh, maybe a, 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 a precision guided missile would have or something. So you can see these, these police here checking just to make sure no one was inside. But right here, actually, this may be the impact point. Uh, and it looks as if uh, it was a mortar. The, that's, but the damage is significant. I mean, that, this is a direct hit that was not intercepted by Israel's missile defense system, the Iron Dome. And uh, Yaniv, if you'll pan down here, I just want to show them this piece of shrapnel on the ground. Um, so a, a mortar or a small rocket hitting this, this uh, kindergarten courtyard and the shrapnel spraying into the walls next door. Trey, it's Emily. Two questions for you. The first is, as you mentioned that you took cover and that you always have a plan, what does cover mean for you? Do you have access to buildings? Is it an overhang? And the second question is, we, we hear a lot of voices right now. Are those primarily journalists? It's about 6 p.m. there in Shabbat. Are these Israeli citizens there? Uh, Tell us and describe the situation yeah. around you. Yeah. So these are mostly journalists uh, that are here because this is a place where you can see directly into the Gaza Strip. I'm just walking here. I want to show you what the police are doing right now. They're assessing the damage and also ensuring that there are no casualties. And we're just going to walk with them. I mean, look at this. This just this shrapnel cut right through mm. this metal fence. And uh, these police officers, they just got to the scene, and the damage on this side of the, of the impact crater is more significant because the shrapnel sprays up against the wall. And, uh, again, they're just looking here to make sure that no one is injured. Uh, but just uh, a, a lot of shrapnel marks on this wall. You can see all of these holes here, all of this on the side of a kindergarten. It's painted these colors because... Normally, in times of war, before Hamas committed the massacre against southern Israel, kids were going to school here. This was a kindergarten that was used by this southern community. Most have evacuated since then. Uh, but you can see, see there are still soldiers and, and police officers in this area because it sits just over the border from the Gaza Strip. Trey, you mentioned that this fire of evaded the Iron Dome. Explain for our viewers, you've done it before. There's a lot of incoming, and sometimes that Iron Dome can be pierced. How does that happen? Yeah, absolutely. So oftentimes, and uh, he's going to pull this out here, and that's just, uh, the that's the engine from the rocket. Just give me one second here. We just want to see, if, yeah, you can actually see a piece of the rocket. So this is a small rocket. And what you're looking at here is the shrapnel from the rocket. They are collecting this as, as we speak. Um, in terms of Israel's missile defense system, the Iron Dome, it works to intercept fire from the Gaza Strip, but it's not perfect. And because there have been more than 8,000 rockets and mortars fired into Israel since that massacre on October 7th, over the past 28 days, they are running low on the, uh, the amount of batteries they have, and they also have to spread out batteries, not just here in the south, but also the north, because there's renewed fire from the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah. And so these towns that many people have evacuated from, there, there are still some civilians that stayed behind. Th they won't intercept all of the rockets. Uh, some of that is, is by calculation from the Israelis trying to preserve the amount of missile defense that they have. And some of it is just by the fact that they are firing so often, Israel's missile defense system can't keep up with that fire. Trey, it's Raymond Arroyo. Given what you're seeing on the ground, how practical is it for the Biden administration to call for a humanitarian ceasefire or a pause, given what you're seeing on the Israeli side? I just want you to, if you pan up to that window you need over there, one second. You can see these officers checking just to make sure no one was inside the building. But these buildings are, they're built to withstand this kind of fire because they're so close to Gaza. Every house here has a shelter and some entire buildings are acting as large shelters. In terms of, of a ceasefire, it's, it's challenging to, to have a ceasefire while rockets are still raining down on Israel. And that's what's being called for here. And it's part of the reason that the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, says he won't have any sort of ceasefire because the fire still continues into Israel. Plus, you have the issue of the hostages. There are 241 Israelis being held. Some of them are foreign nationals, but the majority of them are Israelis, being held inside the Gaza Strip. So there are two conditions for two things. One, fuel into the Gaza Strip. The second, 
has to do with a humanitarian pause. Both of those agenda items will not happen, according to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, until some hostages are released. And so to call for a ceasefire right now, the, the war is unfolding as we speak, and, and it would be incredibly challenging to actually have that be implemented on the ground. Trey Angst, thank you for showing us the reality of war there on the southern border. Excellent reporting, as always. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.